A lot of the judgments you'll hear about the cultural value and effects of Playboy will come from modern commentators espousing modern views for a modern audience. In that context, Playboy is easily and frequently dismissed as a rag that panders to the male gaze and contributes to the objectification of women. These are fair criticisms. It's certainly not a good look when your main product is flying off the shelves because it has naked women in it. And when the, I buy it for the articles, defense is literally paper thin. Not to mention, Playboy as a product was created by men and for men. The rules imposed on playmates and bunnies are also well documented, with curfews and limits on social lives and bodily proportions. Gloria Steinem, the internationally renowned feminist and writer, went undercover at the New York Playboy Club in 1963. Her expose revealed rampant sexism, harassment, and labor abuses. Playboy's first issue came out in the early 1950s, a time of absolutely asphyxiating sexual repression. Dr. Thekla Morganroth described the 1950s as a time when women could choose to be a chaste virgin or a caring mother, not exactly the most fulfilling dichotomy. For their part, men were expected to be stoic family men and productive workers, effectively erasing their time as a bachelor or their interests outside of family. Hugh Hefner was born April 9, 1926 in Chicago. He himself called his parents Midwestern Puritans, though to be accurate they were Methodists. He did well in school, though was bored more than anything else, and only started to come alive when he founded the newspaper for his alma mater, Steinmetz High School. Like everyone else his age, he served in the Army during the Second World War, then came home to study at the Chicago Art Institute and University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as a psych major. Fittingly, he also studied sociology, specifically Alfred Kinsey's Sex Research Institute. Finally, like the good boy he was supposed to be, he got a corporate job at Esquire as a copywriter. Throughout all of it, he identified the American lifestyle as packed to bursting with hurtful and hypocritical behavior. Playboy was Hefner's attempt to rectify the damage that was being done to virtually anyone who dared question whether or not sex was something that could be possibly, maybe, just on the off chance something that is a little bit fun and healthy. And whether or not there were more exciting ways to spend your life than having two and a half kids, living in the expanding suburbs, and getting ground down in a corporate job. But Hefner didn't start it out of the goodness of his heart or because of an overwhelming entrepreneurial spirit. He did it because he was out of a job. Esquire had denied him a raise, so he quit. The first issue was published from his house in Chicago's South Side using $8,000 he'd scraped together from investors, including his mother and brother, and had Marilyn Monroe's famous visage on the cover and as the first sweetheart of the month, Playmate would be coined in the next issue and used for all subsequent models. It was released in December 1953, but without a date given Hefner's uncertainty as to whether or not there'd be a second issue. Interesting to note, Monroe never actually posed for Playboy magazine's first issue. Hefner did the equivalent of buying and printing stock photos. In 1949, Monroe was short on cash and agreed to pose for Tom Kelly for the queenly sum of 50 bucks. Her career took off in 1950 with two big movies. Meanwhile, Kelly sold the photos to Western Lithograph Company, which is where Hefner bought them for $500. Her inclusion is undeniably one of the reasons the first issue sold more than 50,000 copies. And even though Hefner didn't work with her directly, the two eventually became close friends. It should be emphasized that expanding lifestyle options for everyone was always at the root of Playboy, sexuality was just part of how Hefner got people to pick up a copy. Hefner used the magazine to sneak a wide array of interests he thought the modern man should be following. In the first issue, Hefner included an introduction to the magazine that listed four ideal conversation topics for the modern man and his female acquaintance. They were, Picasso, Nietzsche, Jazz, and, Sex. You'll notice that sex comes last. Hefner dumped the profits from the first issue back into the magazine and began a steady expansion. Circulation rose steadily through the 1950s and 60s, partially because there was so little competition and partially because its content, beyond the nudity, was really that good. At its peak in the 1970s, 
Playboy magazine was selling around 5.6 million copies an issue, with November 1972 seeing 7.2 million sales. Cooper Hefner, Hugh's son, took over as chief creative officer in 2016. His time has mostly focused on figuring out how to best update the brand, especially after his father's death in 2017. He's active on social media and has made a few moves that worked and some that didn't. There was the removal of nudity in 2016, a move that was respectable but ultimately reversed in 2017 when Cooper determined nudity wasn't the reason for the decline. He also oversaw the inclusion of the first transgender playmate, Ines Rao, in 2017, yet another time Playboy used its weight to influence an ongoing human rights issue. In spite of all this, circulation fell to roughly 210,000 in 2018 and completely stopped print publication in spring 2020, a victim of the larger decline of print and traditional media. There are ongoing attempts to update the brand, including what could be the promising launch of Centerfold, a sort of Playboy branded OnlyFans. It's way too early to tell what the effect will be, but it's not crazy to think it could work. If there's a fundamental problem, though, it seems to be this. The prevalence and ease of access to online pornography means we're more exposed to sex than the people of 1953 were. In that sense, Playboy magazine accomplished its goal. But used a classic double-edged sword to do it. The rise of consumption of violent and demeaning content means we've leaned heavily into the objectification that, the admittedly rose-colored view of, Playboy sought to avoid. If Playboy was about reshaping the modern man into someone who appreciates the fullness of life, sex included, it's possible we've overcorrected to become a society where sex is an objective to achieve by using other people's bodies. Where Hefner wanted to incorporate a healthy fulfilling sex life into the larger aspects of the modern man, we've completely separated sex, music, politics, and literature. The modern stripping of context prohibits us from thinking about Picasso, Nietzsche, jazz, and sex at the same time. If that is the case, Playboy may be due for another society-shaping moment. They're fully digital now, which means the brand is going to be forced to contend with an internet that hates contextualization more than anything else. But contextualization is what Playboy did best at its peak and if the brand could get Midwestern Puritan society to rethink, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus, it might be able to get the internet to work on its critical thinking. That's it for today. If you enjoyed the story don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video.